Let's talk aesthetic subcultures on social media. I'm talking cottagecore, e-boy, e-girl, dark academia, that girl aesthetic, and those are just the tip of the iceberg. If you've been on Instagram, Pinterest, or TikTok before, you probably know what I'm talking about. These are social media subcultures that are predicated upon the practice of buying items and consuming more goods to fit a certain vibe or aesthetic. It reminds me of Barbie, to be honest. Like she was the queen of the different aesthetics from Malibu Barbie to fairy Barbie to her many different career girl eras. The problem is we are not plastic dolls and so what works for her doesn't work great for us. Which is why I want to dive into how these aesthetic subcultures are leading us down a dark path. I mentioned this topic briefly in one of my more recent videos, how TikTok is fueling overconsumption. So if you haven't seen that one already, go check it out after this one. But for this video, I want to analyze the rise of these subcultures on social media, how they're encouraging hyper consumerist behavior while muddying the way we shape our identities and why it's important for our financial health to decenter material subcultures in the first place. If you're new here, I'm Kara and I make videos on the intersection of money and media while trying to sneak in little bits of financial education in an interesting, accessible way. If that sounds like your cup of tea, be sure to subscribe and check out my other videos like how designer brands keep you poor and existential dread is ruining your personal finance. Okay, back to social media's aesthetic subculture problem. To explain this phenomenon, let's use an aesthetic subculture example that took the world by storm a few years ago, the visco girl aesthetic. If you don't know what the Visco Girl aesthetic is, look no further than Emma Chamberlain circa 2019. Oversized shirts, relaxed shoes, Fjall Raven backpack, and a scrunchie, plus the iconic Hydra Flask. The aesthetic was arguably a cultural reaction to the heavy glam looks that had been popularized by the likes of the Kardashians through the 2010s, and I think it set the foundation for a lot of our recent aesthetics. I mean, Visco Girl walked, so clean girl aesthetic could run. That's all I'm saying. But the magic of the Visco Girl look, like many of these viral aesthetics, is that you know it when you see it, in part because the brands associated are so distinct. Certain brands like Brandy Melville and Birkenstocks became almost this shared language that easily communicated to others that you were aligning yourself with the group. Combining these recognized products allowed social proof to show that you are, in fact, a Visco Girl. The shared language of products within the Visco Girl aesthetic was so well known, Teen Vogue actually made an ultimate Visco Girl starter pack that listed the many items that you would want to have to achieve maximum visco girl status. What's so interesting about this article is that it shows how the aesthetic goes beyond just clothes and accessories. It goes into things like beauty and tech, from the Burt's Bees lip balm to the Fujifilm camera to the reusable metal straws. And yes, these products visually fit the visco girl aesthetic in that they're cute and colorful with soft edges, but if we dig a level deeper, these products also communicate these unspoken values and attributes of the aesthetic subculture. This same concept is explained explored in the Journal of Consumer Research's article, Subcultures of Consumption and Ethnography of the New Bikers. In the piece, the researchers dissect the world of Harley Davidson motorcycle owners, which is a group known for their passion toward the brand and their distinct characteristics. The explained ethos of the Harley Davidson subculture is personal freedom, machismo, patriotism, and American heritage. This right here is the real special sauce of aesthetic consumption-based subcultures. What message about their members are conveyed through products and how does that end up bringing people closer together. To quote the research article, quote, a subculture of consumption come into existence as people identify with certain objects or consumption activities and through those objects or activities identify with other people. It's easy to see this in action on social media because of how accessible it is to build a digital community. Where the Visco Girl aesthetic brought together women who care about the environment, enjoy taking photos, and love positive vibes, something like the cottagecore aesthetic brings together mostly women who care about nature, slow we're living and who enjoy cooking and crafts. All of this goes back to our consumption identity, which is the way that consumption is a part of our daily lives and how we perceive ourselves. We do this in other ways too, such as buying designer brands or gambling, both of which I have made separate video topics about if you want to check those out. But let me give you a chicken or the egg kind of scenario. So on one hand, you have these aesthetic subcultures that allow you to showcase your identity. So say you reject hustle culture and you love the outdoors, you can now showcase that through cottagecore and find like-minded people. But what if it's also working the other way around. What if aesthetics and consumption are significantly molding that identity in the first place and then connecting you with a community that then reinforces that identity? It's a bit of a trippy thought, I know, but I can't help but wonder if the rise in Gen Z's aesthetic board obsession that has been documented by Pinterest at all correlates with the kind of rise in Gen Z loneliness because Gen Z is the loneliest generation alive. Identity and community are made more difficult in isolation, so is it possible 
people that aesthetic subcultures have stepped in as a form of socialization that we are now actively seeking out. It's a tricky line to toe when critiquing this because I honestly don't think it's all bad. I think the internet's ability to connect people is amazing and then this creativity and the collective spirit that comes out of aesthetic subcultures is just really cool. But I also worry that we can sometimes use material goods as a way to shortcut identity and personality. Movie makeover scenes are the perfect example of this. We have been fed this narrative over and over again that there is a direct connection between the products you put on yourself and who you are within. Like, have you ever wondered to yourself, what even is my aesthetic? Because I know I have. Not about you, just about, about me. And that manufactured connection between products and your inner self is exactly what companies prey on when they advertise. The concept is called brand personality. A company tries to attribute human characteristics to its brand so that it resonates with customers. Psychologically, we might start personifying a company as if it's part of our community, our subculture, or even ourself. And you know what you might be saying, who cares if people wanna feel connected to products and aesthetics and subcultures, then let them, let people be happy. And to that I say, absolutely, people have free Will. I'm not trying to tell anyone how to live their lives with these videos, but just raise different questions about that intersection between money and media. That being said, I think there is something worth looking into about how we're allowing materialism to shape our self perceptions. And there's also something worth looking into when it comes to how quickly we're willing to move on to new aesthetic subcultures. As this Vogue article titled Core is the New Chic explains, quote, my issue isn't with the fact that young people are coming up with new trends. I'm more interested in the disposal of these terms and the constant cycle of identifying and naming a new thing only to forget about it a month later. The author makes a great point because microtrends and the constant cycling of new aesthetic subcultures is quite worrying from a sustainability and financial lens. Looking at the Visco Girl starter pack alone, I did the math and if you were to buy all those products on that list, it would cost you $1,485. Let me tell you, that is a lot of money for a starter pack. And that's made even more significant if after every few months or even just once a year, you have a whole new aesthetic subculture that you end up subscribing to. Not to mention with every aesthetic change, there is an army of Hydro Flasks and Brandy Melville now sitting in a landfill, which is not great. Which is why I think it's important for us all to try decentering material goods in our identities. In my opinion, expression, true expression, comes from the act of creating, not consuming. And to me, that's the thesis behind why we have to decenter the materialism that aesthetic subcultures and honestly, society as a whole largely perpetuate. Because yes, things like the clothes we buy, the decor we use, the houses we live in, and the cars we drive are all forms of expression. Someone who buys a Tesla is usually trying to express themselves differently than someone who buys a Prius or a Hummer. But expression can also be how you show up in conflict, how you treat strangers, the jokes you tell, the food you make, the little gifts you leave loved ones, or the art you create. All of those are ways that we can express our personality while simultaneously seeking to better understand our identities. But look, I get why we're eager to obsess over aesthetic subcultures. We as humans face some really heavy questions in our lives, like why are we here? What is my purpose? Who am I in this world? And none of those questions have easy answers, which is why I think we so frequently turn to things like products to be these symbols that we can cling on to. And in the spirit of transparency, I will show you guys my hardcore version of this in my early teenage years. I will admit, I was very much part of the mustache aesthetic subculture of the early 2010s. Um, was it as cute and as whimsical as cottagecore? Eh, debatable. But I think this is a clear example of someone who is trying to define themselves and is using mustache iconography as this illusion of identity. We can move on. This is cringy, so let's... Cut to the next part. Bottom line is that yes, the things that we buy are a part of our identity in some form, but they're not the whole picture. And maybe more importantly, the things that you like in life that make up the parts of you are not always going to mesh in some cohesive aesthetic. Part of why decentering these aesthetic subcultures is so important is so that we can give ourselves space for all the unesthetic mismatched parts of ourselves. That and lifestyle inflation. Let me explain. Part of why any of this matters is that buying material goods runs the the risk of creating unnecessary waste. When we subscribe to fitting cycles of ever-changing aesthetic subcultures, we are more likely to buy items that will soon be discarded. Just think of how many Hydro Flasks have been replaced with Stanley Cups, and we know those Hydro Flasks are durable. They look like they could make a decent dent in someone's skull. That's all I'm saying. 
But the other reason this topic matters is the financial aspect. Lifestyle inflation or lifestyle creep is one of the main reasons that many people will never reach financial independence. Once you start making more money, you start spending more money. So say you're making $50,000 and now you get a raise to $70,000. The lifestyle inflation route would be to take that $20,000 that you got extra and start spending it on things like a nicer gym membership, more facials, a brand new car, a bigger house, all those things. The combating lifestyle inflation route that many financial advisors recommend would be to keep living at the $50,000 budget you'd been living at before and then save the difference. Doing this increases what's known as your savings rate, which is the amount that you're able to save every month. Lifestyle inflation is why you see so many six-figure earners struggling financially. According to Time Magazine, quote, in December 2022, 51% of people who earn more than $100,000 reported living paycheck to paycheck. And while economic inflation can be partially blamed for why six figures doesn't go as far as it used to, it also comes down to living below your means. Because there are a lot of folks out there earning a whole lot less who, in my opinion, are truly living paycheck to paycheck, as in they are on the brink of not being able to feed themselves or house themselves. But as YouTuber Jake Farron explains in his video about his own six-figure paycheck to paycheck lifestyle, sometimes you don't realize the small ways you've increased your spending over time. I always feel like I've painted myself into a corner with bills and lifestyle where I feel like I have to make a certain amount of money or we're just not gonna survive. But going through and seeing like what I actually am spending money on, I'm realizing how much of my spending is not necessary. It's wild how things can slowly build up over time and become the new norm. It's like the boiling frog metaphor where you put a frog in boiling water, it'll jump right out. But if you put it in room temperature water and then slowly heat it up until the water boils, the frog will supposedly stay there. Similarly, if you slowly but consistently inflate your lifestyle over time, you could find yourself in big trouble. And don't get me wrong, I am not saying that we all need to live like our first year out of college forever. I don't think that spending money is inherently wrong at all. I just think that when we do spend money, we should try to be really intentional about it so that it aligns with our values and our goals. If you have a specific saving goal, don't spend recklessly to the point where you're compromising the savings. And if you wanna spend more on something, make sure it's something that truly resonates. Like for me, when I started making more money, I started investing more in my fitness because it aligned with my larger goals and values around physical and mental health. The problem I see is that a lot of lifestyle inflation is around keeping up with the Joneses, a phrase that basically means you wanna show that you're as good as other people by getting what they have and doing what they do. Honestly, it's like aesthetic subcultures on a much wider scale. Like what is the aesthetic of a $100,000 earner or a $500,000 earner? Maybe the aesthetic's shared visual language is country clubs, private schooling, designer brands, McMansions. And I wanna reiterate that I am not claiming that any of these things are inherently bad. Like if these are things that align with your values and goals, then go do them. It's just a matter of making sure that it's something that is actually coming from you and not because you are trying to fit in with some larger aesthetic subculture. Anyways, I think it is so interesting to think about how social media's aesthetic subculture obsession is just this microcosm for larger society. And I don't think any of us are completely immune to it. I know I'm not, but hopefully this video offers a new way to look at the topic and explore your own relationship with aesthetics. Thanks so much for those in the comments who encouraged me to make a video on this topic. And if you have any video topics you'd like to see me cover in the future, make sure to leave a comment below. If you like this video, check out my other recent videos like five things I refuse to spend money on and how alcohol keeps you poor. Be sure to like and subscribe to please the algorithm lords and I will see you guys next time. Bye!